I'm very delighted to be involved in the program um, and I'm going to take a top of the mountain view to talk about psychiatry in the 21st century. To look forward we look back a little bit and there has been a, um, a bit of nostalgia in some of the things that have um, been presented today but in psychiatry when we look back we really shake our heads because it was a terrible history. Now you might think, oh my goodness, this is a long talk if we're starting in the 7th century. But in fact, St Dibna is the uh, patron saint of the mad. And uh, I think St Vincent's Hospital has a St Dibna's ward, but there's usually, there's usually a St Dibna's ward in most hospitals. The Middle Ages, of course, was a terrible time where mental illness was seen as the morally corrupt who suffered from it, and uh, madness was blamed for epidemics, which led to the uh, start of medical involvement. Here's an example of the narrowing vision treatment for mental illness in the late 17th century, which is a commonly used technique by NHMRC in funding grants. <laughs> Women's madness. Women's madness is, a, is even more shameful. There was a brief historical, as a brief historical perspective, Charles Darwin described women as man is superior to woman in intellect, courage and inventive genius. Intuition and perception belong to the lower species, that is women. Henry Maudsley, who has the Maudsley Hospital, which is uh, for psychiatrists like Mecca um, in uh, the UK, um, was influenced by Darwin. And Maudsley wrote that women were only suited to childcare because their natures allowed them to perform boring tasks, repellent and maddening to men. <laughs> In 19th century, the Victorian England theories um, were that women overstepped feminine boundaries, particularly if they were educated. In fact, there, are, there was a paper in what now would be the equivalent of the New England Journal of Medicine, well, the, the British Journal, uh, which said that if you educated women that took blood away from their pelvis, which is where the blood supply should be, and this led to madness. Um, the Lunatics Act in 1845, said that all English counties, this includes Australia uh, as a colony, had to care for lunatics. And so if you um, think about it, what happened is a lot of the asylums were built in Melbourne around the Yarra River. Um, and if you think about, well, why would you do that? It was because of the Lunatics Act that in fact the Act also said you were not allowed to transport mad people on the King's Highway and hence people who had mental illness were transported along the Yarra River in a barge. And that's where the phrase going around the bend comes from. It's going around the Yarra Bend. So this is you know, a magnificent contribution that uh, Victoria has made to the English language. In 1905, women were institutionalised in large numbers. In my PhD, one of the things I got to do was to go and look through some of the um, old, old records and, and in fact I found that 27% of the female population were institutionalised. They were institutionalised for such things as menopause, institutionalised for having love affairs, institutionalised for having babies out of wedlock and that's the diagnosis that was given. Lobotomies, so we know what happened there, patients were cured of everything, personality, thoughts, memories and emotions. We still have some big issues in psychiatry. There's diagnostic uncertainty. There's no objective diagnostic or theragnostic test. We have a spectrum of disorders. We are dealing with complexity in terms of the organ of, of our illnesses, which is the brain, and we are beset by stigma. There's a lot of confusion out there between mental health and mental illness and there's a lot of loose terminology, the mind or the brain. Schizophrenia, major mood disorders, anxiety and others, I will remind you, are all brain diseases. Everybody is an expert when it comes to mental health or mental illness and this actually increases some of the stigma in some, some ways because you hear comments, you know, if only they just pull up their socks and get over that depression. Um, you know, she went mad because you know, she didn't uh, do things in the correct fashion, or whatever it is. And this myth mythology is quite prevalent in our field. So when we think about the sorts of research that we've been doing, what is really apparent is that we need better biological understanding of mental illnesses. <coughs> Absolutely, psychosocial factors are going to affect the outcomes, but I would say that's the same for any illness, whether you're talking about cancer, diabetes, whatever it is. 
psychosocial factors. Each, each patient is different with a different set of environmental and others. So it's not any different when you come to psychiatry. But what is different is the biological component in which we are still in our infancy in terms of understanding the brain in psychiatric illnesses. So at MAPRC, we have made it our mission to put the brain in the centre of mental disorders. I was very privileged that our MAPRC was given the, the task, or we, we took it ourselves, to actually set up a recent uh, symposium on August 19th called Innovating Psychiatry Through Neuroscience. And we were grateful to uh, the Academic Health Science Centre Neuroscience Stream, which we're part of, for funding this, this um, particular workshop. We had materials engineering researchers, molecular biolog biologists, immunologists, stem cell researchers, psychiatrists, psychologists, gut biome researchers, you'll be pleased to hear, Steve, um, nanotechnology experts, genetics, epigenetics, biostats, bioengineers, neurosurgeons, and above all, students from all kinds of disciplines at this workshop. We did that deliberately because the answers in psychiatry, and I suspect in other areas, is by breaking down the silos. We no longer think about working just with psychiatrists and psychologists. That is very limited and not getting the field forward. We had a resolution that came out of that particular workshop. In fact, it was an immunologist from uh, Eric Moran's group who joined us and said, you know, one of our issues is we've got to get together to work on the molecular phenotype of schizophrenia, autism and the subtypes of depression. Now, this fits very well with what's happening in the world in psychiatry. And this brings me to my topic, which is where are we right now? The NIMH, which is the National Institute of Mental Health in Washington, are proceeding with what's called the Research Domains Criteria Approach. This is a uh, short form is RDOC. It's a research framework for new ways of studying mental disorders, which integrates many levels of information from genomics to self-report to better understanding of a number of different dimensions and functioning of the brain and human behavior from normal to abnormal. They put five domains together, and these domains probably won't mean very much to people who are not in the research field in this area, but I'm just giving it to you as a snippet of uh, an example of where the field is headed in terms of even you know, classifying the research structures. So for example, in the negative valence system, you can think of all these different things, fear, anxiety, sustained threat, loss, frustrate, fr frustrative, non-reward behaviours. When you look at something like loss, so here we would think about our traditional diseases, depression. We have a number of genes that are associated with this particular event of loss. We also have a number of molecules. So for example, down-regulation of glucocorticoid receptors, the up-regulation of CRH, my, my pet area, estrogens, androgens, oxytocin, etc. We have brain circuits that are involved with this. And you can see a number of them, but particularly the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, circuitry is very significant in a number of mental illnesses. We also have some physiology looking at the neuroimmune dysregulation. And then we have the behaviours, and there's a number of behaviours listed there. And then there are the self-reports, as in what happens as a consequence of these behaviours. So this is just an example of where our thinking and our research processes move to, move, are moving to fairly rapidly in the field. So as you can see, in order to be undertaking psychiatric research in the 21st century and from here on end, we are expecting that our researchers, if not be experts in the genetics, molecular biology, the circuitry and so on, at least have an, a capacity to speak the language that other people in these areas will be speaking to integrate these into our own frameworks. And, and I can go on and show you a whole bunch of these, but I, I won't. With this kind of framework and our own thinking here, right here in MAPRC, part of CCS, part of Monash and the Alfred, we have been implementing this in our own way, thinking about our work to extend our new, into new diagnostic systems, new treatments and new opportunities for prevention in mental illnesses. I was fortunate and unfortunate to work with biomedical engineers and have been doing so since 2004. And we won the New Inventors in 2010, an ABC program, for our invention, which, is t which was using the vestibular system as a marker of the uh, limbic system in particular, and then using this test 
as a, as a diagnostic test. Now I'm delighted to report that um, there's a new company that has taken over the uh, capital um, venture aspect of this and they expect to float this particular, uh, in this particular test on the stock market in 2016. So again, this is an interesting challenge that was thrown down to us about the diagnostics and this is our approach using biomedical engineering expertise combined with psychiatrists, not a usual combination but one that was fruitful and productive. Just to go through briefly some of the research that we have conducted and are conducting, and I don't have time to go through the 162 projects we have running at the moment, but schizophrenia research at MAPRC follows this kind of mechanism, mechanistic approach, which is the implicated genes, the putative mechanism, the intermediate phenotypes, and the observable phenotypes. And so we know a lot about schizophrenia in terms of its severity of illness and the type of symptoms that are involved. We're using um, imaging systems that give us pretty pictures like this, the diffusion tensor imaging systems, to study some of the changes that happen in white matter. Um, here's a, an example of a DTI of a patient with schizophrenia versus a patient who's a, a healthy subject, just to show you the difference in the sorts of circuitry connections that occur in schizophrenia. The neurophysiological work that is conducted, including eye movement abnormalities, pre-pulse inhibition, and there's a number of studies going on in these areas. As I say, I'm going to give you a head spin by going through a number of the projects, but I want you to get an idea of the targets and the sorts of research areas that we're involved in. New drugs, um, again, we're very uh, involved and have been. We have our own setup of, of clinical drug trials, methodologies, phase three um, studies mainly, but we've also got into some phase two trials, and we are working with um, people in, in uh, Monash again to look at some of the earlier phased trials. But schizophrenia drugs have changed. You know, there was a concept that it was all dopamine, certainly not. Now we have a number of different uh, targets, including the NMDAR system, um, the strategies that are there are to look at glycine, um, D-cycloserin and so on, some, uh, some of the other um, metabolic indicators of the NMDAR system, and also our own work in looking at some of the glycine uh, metabolism um, drugs that are available even in health food stores. So we, we've got a wide range of drug uh, testing, and clinical drug trials, we're working with pharma industry, but also working um, as investigator-led research in this area. We um, have been using neurohormone modulators for some time. My work's been looking at estradiol and schizophrenia, currently looking at selective estrogen receptor modulators in men and women with schizophrenia, looking at tamoxifen in bipolar disorder. We've been involved in repurposing old drugs, so for example on Dancitron, which is an anti-nausea drug, which you'll know very well, has been used, um, it, we're trialling that in schizophrenia because of its uh, 5-HT3 or serotonin receptor activity. I'm also interested in, at the moment, looking at borderline personality disorder, which I think is a misnomer for traumatic disorder. And um, again, we're looking at uh, cognitive functioning in this group and mamantine, which is actually an Alzheimer's drug, looking at improving cognitive functioning in people who've been severely sexually traumatised. My uh, very good friend and colleague, Professor Paul Fitzgerald, who is the Deputy Director, heads up a large um, depression research group. Uh, he and many others, of course, are involved in looking at this particular disorder, which has a very high morbidity and also a high mortality and carries a huge um, disease burden. One in six Australians have been prescribed antidepressants. 19% of all women and 15% of men in Australia have been prescribed antidepressants. So this is a big problem for our country. I won't go through all the bits and pieces, but again, even thinking about depression is probably different to the way you were trained if you looked at depression as a medical student or nursing student or some other clinical student. Even 10 years ago, you would have been taught things quite differently. I just, as a salient reminder, put this slide up because doctors, here you see the blue, the male and female are yellow, um, have very high levels of psychological distress. You can see compared to the Australian population and other professionals, depression is much higher in our profession. And worse, suicide ideation is also very high in doctors compared to the Australian prof uh, general population and other professionals. And I put that in there as a reminder of just how awful this condition really is. 
So if we think about what's going on in terms of MDD, major depression, you know, there was a theory that it was all serotonin at one point. It certainly is not. Here is a rundown of some of the theories of depression. And we think, just like schizophrenia, we're not dealing with one condition. We're dealing with several different subtypes with possibly different um, origins in, in terms of onset. So like, pretty much like you know, depression and some of the other things that people have been talking about in terms of other conditions. So there is a genetic vulnerability, there's altered HPA axis activity, there is a monoamine hypothesis, but then we also have various brain uh, region dysfunction, neurotoxic, neurotrophic processes, reduced GABAergic activity, dysregulation of the glutamate system, impaired circadian rhythms, and the GABA abnormalities as well. We have a big therapeutic arm of research. We're involved in pharmacotherapy. We use pharmacogenomic testing. We're also engaged in psychotherapy. I wouldn't want to give you the idea that um, you know, we're, we're sort of down the molecule end. We are, but we integrate that with a whole range of other types of um, treatments. And we do research all these other areas as well. Um, so here's an example of some of the, the depression treatments. Um, light treatment, gonadal hormone treatments for women with perimenopausal depression, and a whole range of very important treatments which Paul Fitzgerald and a number of the team members, Dr Kate Hoy, Dr Bex Seagrave, uh, Dr Bernie Fitzgibbon, and many others who are in the room are involved with. And these are the brain stimulation techniques that Paul and his colleagues have developed. They are world leaders in, in this area and um, again have uh, exported this knowledge um, to other parts of the country but also other parts of the world. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, transcranial direct current stimulation and that's a picture of Paul. Um, trans, uh, so for unipolar depression, for bipolar depression, for depression occurring after a head injury, TDCS which again is an area that Dr Beck Seagrave has been uh, working in for schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorders. And I don't want to give you the impression that we're just working in schizophrenia and depression. We certainly are in bipolar disorder, anxiety, eating disorders, complex trauma disorders, addictions and dementia work, as a dementia work, and systems and services research as well as pedagogical research. There are 162 of us. Um, there are 63 people on premise and the rest are affiliates. Um, and we need to be broad because mental health, psychiatry is a huge field. We touch base with neuroscience, we also touch base with religion, we touch base with philosophy. Um, obviously all of the areas, uh, computronics, biomedical engineering, mathematics, um, really do impact on the work that we're doing. If we're going to push psychiatry out of that shameful past, and into a future where it is not seen as the weird specialty that has weird patients and sits out the back of a hospital, but it is absolutely at the forefront of being able to provide people with a quality of life as they are living longer, they need to live better, and to be struck down by a mental illness does rob people of a quality of life. So our job is that we want to make sure that people understand that mental illness mental illnesses are brain disorders and we are using technology to unlock the brain. Thank you for your attention.